So this week, I'm very pleased to introduce Erica Carlson. So Erica came up uh, earlier this year and gave a more technical talk to the in the condensed matter seminar slot, um, and lots of positive feedback after that. That she was just a great educator and explainer of things, and wouldn't it be good to have her back? to give a more general talk to the whole department. And of course, back in the old days when people actually visited us, we would quite often have people give, give a, a general talk and a more specific talk. So, so that's what we're doing with Erica, except it's a couple of months apart, but still. Um, uh, she's at the University of Purdue and is an expert on quantum materials, but is also known for her outreach and uh, education efforts. So um, she's talked to us today about quantum materials. So it's all yours, Erica. Great, thank you so much for the uh, invitation. And it's uh, it's great to be talking with you again. I guess the first question I have for you is, can you can you see a slide there? Looks good. Yes. Okay, very good. <laughs> All right, so I wanna to talk to you about phases of matter, but phases of matter that are happening in, uh, in what we call uh, quantum materials. Um, I have a long list of collaborators because this is a, a, a growing line of, of research. And uh, on the theory side, I have to acknowledge my, uh, uh, my primary theory collaborator, Karen Dahman at University of Illinois. Um, and the, the following people are uh, graduate students who have been in my research group, and some of them are now uh, uh, have PhDs. So there's uh, Dr. Liu and Dr. Philobom have graduated, and Forrest Simmons is still in the group, and Yifan Wong is still at Purdue as well. Experimentally, uh, many collaborators, um, uh, Jennifer Hoffman uh, at Harvard University, um, along with uh, Conley Song and Liz Main, um, uh, Dimitri Bazov, now at Columbia University, as well as Mumtaz Kazelbosch and uh, Kirk Post and Alex McLeod, all working in the, in the same group, although uh, Kirk has moved on now, also Dr. Post and has, has moved on. Um, and Alex is a, is a postdoc. Uh, we have several funders. Actually, I, I'm, I, I'm listing my funders. Uh, my experimentalist list would go on and on. They, they're very, very well funded. And here are some references where you can see um, the, the final uh, work I'll, I'll talk about. So in, uh, in, in condensed matter physics, um, uh, the, what do we mean by, by condensed matter? Um, Honestly, if I talk to a member of the general public about what's condensed matter, they, they usually guess something having to do with neutron stars, something very, very, very dense. But really, we just mean something that's condensed in the sense of condensation, in the sense that gas condenses to liquid, liquid condenses to solid. And so we're really uh, a, a, a discipline that's about phases of matter and about phase transitions. And so, uh, so here, for example, I'm showing some of our, our favorite phases of, of water. We have water in the solid phase on the left and in the liquid phase in the middle and, and in the middle, the, the gas or the, or the vapor phase. But another way to, to view condensed matter physics is that we're really, we're really the science of stuff you can touch, right? So, you know, if you can pick it up and hold it in your hand, like this, principles of condensed matter theory. If you can pick it up and hold it in your hand, it's a it's a condensed matter system. It's it's stuff you stuff you can touch, things that are, you know, on that order. So uh, I, I say it that way because an, a star is is too large. You know, I can't hold a star in my hand. Uh, a single atom is too small. I can't hold just one at a time. I'm holding many, many, many atoms at a time. And when you when you hold a, a macroscopic object in your hand, you're holding on the order of an Avogadro's number of particles. Six times ten to the twenty-three particles are uh, roughly. And so those kinds of, of systems count as condensed matter. And so the phase of matter that something's in is, is of paramount importance. And so solid, liquid, gas, these are phases of, of matter that come to mind. Um, plasma might also come to mind, but there's no uh, sharp phase transition between gas and plasma, so we don't, we don't really distinguish. And um, you can also make the argument that between, um, between liquid and gas, there are ways to sneak around that phase transition. So for example, if you have water and you raise the temperature enough and raise the pressure enough, you can get into a regime where the distinction between liquid and gas goes away. And so you can actually make that phase transition go away. So we kind of sometimes just lump those all into fluids, although, although certainly there are certain regimes where you do get a sharp phase transition and a sharp distinction between liquid and, and gas. 
Um, crystals are certainly very special, right? No, you, you don't get confused. Like if you have a glass of water, like what I'm showing here on the left, you know, in your glass of water, you don't get confused as to which parts the ice and which parts the liquid water. It's pretty clear which part you should be drinking and which part you should not attempt to break your teeth on. Um, but there are actually many more phases of matter than the solid liquid gas that gets uh, uh, communicated more more broadly. And uh, in fact, uh, so, you know, you're probably watching this on something that's an LCD display, a liquid crystal display. So uh, something that's a liquid crystal is uh, a combination. It's It's got some liquid like properties and it's also got some crystal like properties. So. Um, you know there are many uh, examples of those, but but for the most part they'll have some property like it's it's um, rigidly solid or crystalline in one direction, but flows in the other direction. So for example, a, a good example is something that's got kind of these sheets to it. The 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 green piece here um, uh, that looks like looks like little lines is in a in a smectic phase. And so if you tried to kind of squish that material in the direction. Um, where the where the planes are lying flat, it, it's not uh, something that's easy to flow in that direction. And yet there can be transport along those uh, those stripes or along those sheets. Those sheets can slide past each other, and the the sliding past each other freely is a property of a of a liquid. So this this green thing here is in the uh, the smectic phase. You can get way more exotic phases as well: nematics, exotics, cholesterics. Um, nematics in particular are 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 a very interesting phase of matter because they're they're liquid like liquid in the sense of the the molecules that make up a nematic can slide past each other and they can slide past each other in any direction but to get a nematic you need a, a long floppy molecule so something something long and floppy and um when you get a nematic the the little long floppy molecules in the liquid choose an average direction in which to point and so it's an oriented liquid. Molecules can slide past each other, but they stay more or less pointed in the same direction because they're interacting with their, their neighbors. So kind of an odd thing about a nematic is that, yes, it flows, but if you try to get it to flow around a bend, that costs energy. So if you put it in a pipe that's then gonna bend, that'll, that'll cost energy. It's called a, a splay energy as those molecules uh, come away from their preferred orientation with respect to each other and splay out a little bit. And, and there are lots of, of these uh, phases. I've, I've put a box here for glass and amorphous solids because they're in a, a they're clearly in a different category, right? I mean, you, you're familiar with the glass phase. It's, it's what your windows are, are made of. Um, I mean, the windows through which you, you, that you look out through the, the world uh, at, uh, not necessarily the windows on your screen, but, but windows in a, in a house or in a building. And uh, that's uh, silicon dioxide. Okay, so silicon dioxide in its crystalline phase is quartz, a very beautiful mineral with nice hexagonal crystals in it. But when it's in its amorphous um, uh, configuration, it's, it's, it's window glass or, or, or other types of glass. It's just glass, I should say. Um, and, and, you know, so sometimes people debate, is that a, a truly distinct phase transition or phase of matter? Is it just something that's out of equilibrium? It's clearly out of, out of equilibrium. And I've, I've put its own little box around it. Um, but, but suffice it to say, there are very interesting and deep questions going Going on in, in uh, research about those kinds of uh, phases of matter. And we have superfluids as well in Bose Einstein condensates. Uh, Bose Einstein condensates, you know, have, have gotten a lot of the, the attention, of course. Um, superfluids, I think, are a little bit um, possibly more intuitive to think about. You know, if you have, um, if you think about trying to stir a liquid, so I have here. You know, a, a, a mug with liquid in it. If I if I reach in and kind of stir the liquid, it's it's water based. Um, it's actually just plain water um, because that's too late for me to have coffee right now. But uh, if you try to stir it, you know, there's a little bit of viscosity to it. You can feel certain aspects of the water. You feel that it's that it's wet, and and when you stir it, you feel a viscosity. If you um, take a thicker liquid, so something like honey, for example, and try to stir honey, it's it's uh, it's thicker. You you get more resistance when you try to stir it. Um, um, you can uh, think of going the other direction, though. What if I had a less viscous fluid than water or than honey? You know, so so go less and less viscous. If you have a superfluid, a superfluid is a fluid that can flow, of course, because it's a fluid. But if you were to stick your finger in and try to stir the superfluid, it would feel like nothing because 
the defining characteristic of a superfluid is that its viscosity has gone to zero. There's no resistance when you try to stir things. Now, I, I don't recommend that you actually stick your finger in a superfluid. They're very, very cold. So don't, don't actually do that. Maybe take a stick or something. But the viscosity really has gone to zero. So you don't feel resistance when you try to stir the thing. And, you know, there, there are many other phases that we actually, you know, encounter in our everyday lives, but perhaps don't get into, uh, I'd say, maybe the high school or even undergraduate textbooks as distinct phases of matter. But when they have different characteristics that are that are vastly different, we should put them in their own, you know, um, category. Right. So something that's familiar to us from everyday life would be foams. Um, I was on sabbatical in, in uh, uh, Paris last year, and so we got very familiar with what it looks like when you slice through a baguette. Um, oh, the fact that I said slice is uh, probably going to, uh, that, that's actually uncouth. You're t technically supposed to break a baguette, but uh, what can I say? We're American. We still sliced it. But you can see the nice little holes inside the bread when you do that. And of course, um, Bread's a foam, just like a, a, a sponge uh, is, is a foam, or this is a shaving cream, it's a, it's a foam. Uh, this nice rubber ducky is, is just incidental to the picture of bubbles. Uh, I had to put that in because my daughter's favorite foam in the world is bubble bath with lots and lots and lots of bubbles. But when you have those kind of configurations, you know, they have different properties. They're, they're you know, in a sense, uh, something that's foamy like that can, before you bake it in the oven and turn it into bread, um, can slide and and um, uh, you know can can flow under certain circumstances um, and and yet it can still maintain its shape so it's it's uh, it's distinct um, suspensions are are something different going on as as well so familiar suspensions would be you know anytime you you've got um, you've tried to mix a couple of things that are hard to mix but you might be able to whisk them together and get them to sort of uh, stay together for a while. So oil and vinegar together would be an example of how to do a suspension, um, uh, a, a mixture that, that then when you uh, uh, beat it enough, you can turn it into a nice little vinaigrette there. Um, mayonnaise is even better because you put a little bit of the, the egg yolk in there and it acts as an emulsifier and it keeps the little tiny bubbles that you make uh, uh, distinct from each other. And so it holds its shape a little bit better. Uh, granular matter does distinct things. So these are, uh, you know, I said sand piles here, but these are actually pictures of, uh, of spices. And so um, if you were to, to take these piles and try to add to them to make them taller, you'd find out that at some point there's a critical angle to each of them. And so you, you know, it's got it's got its own properties to it. You know, uh, granular matter is something that can flow under certain circumstances, and yet it holds its shape in those nice little little piles. And then there's all sorts of messier stuff that that are also distinct phases of matter. Um, we're all very familiar with hand gel right now, right? <laughs> and, uh, so you you know you squirt that on your hand, and it's yeah, it's liquid like. You can rub it around, but before you rub it around, it makes that nice little little uh, well-contained uh, lump. There's you know there's polymers in there that are that are making it do that, giving it its its stiffness. And um, certainly, if you have any any kids in your house, you know in the past ten years, they've probably asked you to make slime or they've made some slime or they brought home some slime. Um, so there's a, a, a nice picture of slime and, you know, other, other, uh, cross link polymers in our lives would be, uh, rubber bands and, and, uh, and jello. So lots and lots and lots of different phases of matter from just the regular solid liquid and gas. Um, now I study what electrons do inside of solids, uh, and, and electrons, it turns out that electrons inside of materials, electrons have their own phases of matter and they have their own phase transitions that they can have. Uh, so, um, for example, you you uh, have some magnets in your life. Okay, I put a box here for the for the magnets. So if you think about the the permanent magnets that you use, um, you're you're surely using some right now uh, in the speakers you're using. There's probably a, a magnet there that's changing an electrical signal into uh, a sound wave so that you can you can hear my voice. But you probably use magnets to hold maybe a to do list to the refrigerator or a shopping list to the refrigerator, something like that. Of course, I'm never far from magnets because not only are they good toys, but uh, they're good, uh, you know, teaching devices. So um, there we go. There's the magnets that I have nearby. Um, if you were to take these things, so these guys are, are pretty strong. They're um, neodymium magnets. Um, but if you were to take this thing, and it's very, I have a very tiny one here, 
and heat it up enough, you would find, well, certainly if you heated it up enough, the thing would just melt at some point. And so the material itself would undergo a phase transition. But even before the material melted, you would find an electronic phase transition. Um, there'd be some intermediate temperature while it's still in the solid phase at which the magnetism just suddenly, poof, disappeared. And then if you cool it back down again, the magnetism will suddenly reappear. And so when properties change dramatically like that at a particular temperature, that's a phase transition. So there's, a, there's an electronic phase transition between the ferromagnetic phase when tiny magnetic moments inside the material line up and what we call the paramagnetic phase when those magnetic moments haven't necessarily gone away, but thermal fluctuations have made it such that they are no longer pointing on average in the, in the same direction. And so that's an actual phase transition, but it's a phase transition that the electrons are doing. Um, metals are certainly very important technologically. If you um, uh, put a voltage on a metal, electrons flow. Something that flows is a liquid phase of matter. And so we do say formally that the electrons inside of metals are in a, in a liquid phase. We would call it a Fermi liquid phase because they're fermions, but it's still a liquid phase. Um, semiconductors have certainly been extremely important technologically, right? That's uh, uh, the basis of, of uh, your, your computer hardware uh, is uh, semiconductors. I've put band insulators in the same box because there's no formal phase transition between them. You could use diamond as a semiconductor if you were willing to run it at something like 5,000 Kelvin not recommended for human operating temperatures. And there are many, many other electronic phases of matter. Superconductors are, um, are a phase where the electrons can flow, of course, they, they conduct electricity. What's super about them is that um, they manage to do it without losing any uh, energy at all. There's no resistance. When we have you know, the metals that we use, like the, the wires that you, you use uh, to, to charge your devices, you know, this is my little iPhone charging cable, Typically, it's, it's copper in there. Um, and of course, it, we use it because it conducts electricity. It can charge my device. But it actually loses energy, the whole line. The whole line is just radiating energy away because while it's a good conductor, it's not a perfect conductor. And so what that means is that the electrons, as they flow around in the material, um, they actually do a lot of bumping around. They bump and they knock into the material and they, they cause other excitations. So an electron will slam into an atom and start that atom vibrating, which starts other atoms vibrating, which eventually leads to black body radiation and dissipates away as heat. So we like superconductors because through a trick of quantum mechanics, they manage to be able to have actually zero resistance. Um, Quantum hull phases, very interesting phases of matter. This is where we lock the electrons into flat land. So um, everything I've discussed so far is a phase of matter that's a three-dimensional phase of matter. Quantum hull phases happen when we make certain semiconductor sandwiches. And at, when you put two materials together, um, right there at the interface, the, 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 the boundary between them is a two-dimensional system. And uh, um, people who build quantum hull devices are very skilled at making those in such a way that you can trap uh, a set of electrons there. So you can trap a fluid of electrons there. And if you uh, apply a magnetic field perpendicular, those electrons go through all sorts of exotic phases of matter, depending on how strong of a magnetic field you've put on, and also depending on how clean you make the sample. And so it turns out, once you get to this box, if you were trying to count how many phases of matter I had, I had uh, mentioned so far, once you get to quantum Hall phases, as far as we know, it's, it's an infinite cascade, theoretically speaking. Obviously, no one's measured infinity, but, uh, but theoretically speaking, we think as a function of, of applied field, you can get an infinite cascade of, of phases. Um, Electronic liquid crystals are also possible. This is where the electrons inside of a material uh, would have some sort of liquid-like properties to them and some sort of crystal-like properties to them. Uh, so I've got here a, a picture of, um, uh, this is uh, scanning tunneling microscopy taken on, um, on a cuprate superconductor, um, NCCOC. Uh, this is out of uh, Seamus Davis's group. And th it's just interesting textures. The, the length scale of this is such that um, the, the base here is about uh, 10 nanometers wide. The space between one of these long yellow lines and another long yellow line is about 16 uh, angstrom. So this is pretty small scale stuff. But there's interesting electronic textures that are arising 
uh, they give you these nice little long lines. Sometimes the lines can get fairly long, but they don't go forever. There's a long line and then it kind of cuts off and then there's another line that goes in another direction. So, but along those lines, there's there seems to be the uh, ability for those electrons to flow along that line, at least it, till, it, till it ends, but they don't flow so well between the lines. And so in that sense, because of the combination of liquid-like properties of flow and rigid properties in the other direction, we would call that a, a liquid crystal phase. So how do we, how do we uh, understand these various phases of matter? How do we categorize them? We'd like some sort of systematic way to, de to describe them. Um, a major way that we classify phases of matter is by the symmetry properties that they, uh, that they follow. And so I've used here just as an example, a schematic of long floppy molecules, but the, the principles are the same for other, other things. If you're in the low temperature crystalline phase, then you're talking about something where um, the constituents have a regular periodicity to them. So from one molecule to the next is a set distance, and that set distance is a regular periodicity that goes on for the entire uh, space of the, the material. And for a crystal, it's going to be periodic like that in, in all directions. That periodicity brings along with it rigidity. We're very familiar with the fact that if we take, you know, a hunk of solid matter, something that's in the crystalline phase, it's, it's um, you know, you can't squeeze the thing and deform it very easily. There's a rigidity that pops up as a result of that uh, pattern to it. The very high temperature phase would be liquid. All the molecules are, are uh, disordered with respect to each other. Um, and in between, you can get those interesting liquid crystal phases. You could have what I mentioned before, the oriented liquid, which we call a nematic, or a smectic phase where in these layers here, so you have a periodicity from one layer to the next. So that's the crystalline direction, the layer stacking direction. But within a layer, these little molecules can flow past each other. So they're liquid-like within a layer, or you can think of the layers uh, flowing past each other can happen as well, but there's a rigid periodicity between the, the layers. And, and so one of the, you know, the, the key aspect here would, would be symmetry. And um, in fact, we mean symmetry um, uh, over long distances and long times. So in fact, uh, although the schematic I've drawn here would look like the crystal is the most symmetric phase. In fact, when you time average, if you think of these things moving around and then you take a time average of that, then the smectic would smear out within each layer. The pneumatic would smear out everywhere and the liquid would smear out everywhere. Okay, so if you were to then, you know, take a, a, a time averaged uh, uh, view of a liquid, it's homogeneous. Um, when viewed on long time scales and when viewed on long distances. Obviously, if you're looking at tiny distances on the atomic scale, it's not going to look homogeneous. But when viewed on long scales and on long times, it becomes homogeneous again. And we would say that's the fully symmetric phase because whatever the uh, symmetry properties are of free space are satisfied then by the liquid in the high temperature, highly symmetric um, phase, so, you know, symmetry such as, you know, rotational symmetry. If I rotate the liquid, does it look the same? Yes. If I translate the liquid by a small amount, does it look the same? Yes. But only when viewed over long distances and over long times. There's another major way in which we classify phases of matter, which is by topology. Um, and uh, so just here's, a, you know, example of the basic uh, concept of topology. The, the, the first row of objects here are topologically distinct in that uh, the beach ball doesn't have any hole through it through which you could pass your hand. There's no handle to the thing. The, the coffee mug has one hole through which you can you can hold it. And there's no continuous deformation you could do of this coffee mug to turn it back into the shape of a ball. Um, the, that, that hole is a, a topologically distinct from having no holes. And a pretzel, of course, has, well, a pretzel before you start eating it has three holes. And this colander has has many. Another way to look at topology is as as braiding. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and if you haven't seen the recent work uh, coming out of Purdue on uh, braiding statistics, I'd encourage you to look at that, that uh, those new results out of Mike Manfred's group. Uh, they managed to braid anions, which is a, a, a very uh, nice new result. And so the, the concept of, of braiding um, is really only well defined if you could take this, this braided ponytail and loop it back onto itself. Okay, that's where it becomes very, very well defined. But of course, no one does hairstyles that way. They'd have to cut the hair off. So that's not that's not cool. But you can see that there, there are distinct ways that you can think of, of braiding different um, objects. So like I said, my research group was interested in um, 
electrons, electronic phases of matter, electronic phase transitions, and we're interested in quantum materials. Now, uh, what makes something a quantum material is a bit of a fuzzy definition, but we're, we're interested in um, being able to, you know, some material where we want to pull the quantum properties to the forefront and we want to learn how to control those properties. So, so in that sense, honestly, um, a ferromagnet, a regular permanent magnet is a quantum material because you can't get net magnetism in a purely classical theory. It really is an explicitly quantum effect. So, so the first quantum material that, that humans domesticated, I should say, you know, we found it out in the wild and started using it for our own technological purposes. The first one really is is, is permanent magnets. Um, uh, semiconductors are a great example of you know something where there are some quantum effects there that are very important. Some not so quantum effects. In some cases in semiconductors we can think of the electrons as tiny balls moving around. That's not a very quantum picture. But it turns out that the energetic states, the, the actual energies that those electrons can have in the material are a quantum effect. We get energy bands where the electron can be and then distinct energy gaps and those gaps um, are, are a, a, a clear quantum effect there. Um, so the, the more advanced, more uh, newer quantum materials, you know, we're thinking of things like uh, uh, superconductors, or maybe we have, uh, we want to be able to reach in and, and more clearly control the spin of the electron, or um, the, uh, the orbital degrees of freedom, meaning exactly what shape um, quantum mechanical wave function is this electron uh, uh, sitting in. Um, so here are some examples of, of uh, some quantum materials. And um, what the thing uh, that I want to uh, highlight to you is that, that sometimes these phases of matter are, are rather difficult to describe because they can actually end up being inhomogeneous. Um, the, the phases I've mentioned before were mostly homogeneous, except perhaps for, you know, right here when I showed you what the liquid crystals can look like in, in, inside of materials, the, the electronic liquid crystals. And so once again, um, these are uh, images of electrons taken by different, um, different groups under different um, using different types of probes, different types of experiments. Um, and so the, the, the thing I want to draw your attention to, though, is that different materials, but there's in many of them, there can be this inhomogeneity coming up. Um, so the ones on the left are materials that undergo a metal insulator transition, but it turns out that they don't go from metal to insulator all at once, there's this intricate, interesting pattern formation going on. These two panels are from uh, the, the group of Dmitry Bazov using scanning near-field optical microscopy. Um, the thing to, to notice, though, is that um, you know green is metal, blue is, is insulator, and so there's this coexistence region um, that the material has where the electrons have sort of clumped up into very interesting textures. Uh, they're not making distinct little bubbles. They're kind of very, very frilly structures. Um, and the, the top middle and in the, in the upper right are examples of cuprate superconductors. This one in the top middle is out of uh, Seamus Davis's group using scanning tunneling microscopy. The one in the top right is out of Jennifer Hoffman's group at Harvard using scanning tunneling microscopy. And the, they're different uh, materials, but they're both cuprate superconductors. Um, and and this, this field of view is about 10 nanometers across. The one on the right is about 50 nanometers across. So looking at, at different length scales, but still interesting pattern formation coming up, even at those different length scales. Um, the bottom middle is another way, another view of a metal insulator transition material, V203, viewed with photo emission uh, spectroscopy. The one on the lower right is a strontium iridate um, viewed with uh, scanning tunneling microscopy. That's work out of the group of Milan Allen at Leiden. Um, and and um, the phase separation here is, is interesting between um, a, a MOT phase and a, and a pseudogap phase. So, so we're interested in um, how to classify these kinds of textures. Where do they, where do, where do textures like this fit into our categories of phases of matter and phase transitions. Because, you know, most of the phases of matter that, that we're used to, like, you know, liquid water in my mug here, or, or the ice cubes that I might put in it to cool it down, are rather homogeneous, right? They, they don't have these kind of interesting textures. So this is, this is a new thing that, uh, that experiments are revealing for us. And it's new enough that it calls for, for new theoretical concepts and how to, how to describe them. But 
let me tell you a little bit more about how we think about phase transitions in general. This is uh, a phase transition that you're used to, but viewed from a different perspective. Um, this is water. It's just regular water in a water bottle, but it's very, very cold. And look what happens when they pour it out. I bet that hasn't happened to you yet. Oh no, maybe it had. No, you're up in you're up in Canada where it's cold. This might even <laughs> you might you might have had this experience where you know in the winter time maybe you had a water bottle sitting in your car and you picked it up and it looked liquid, but then when you shook it or when you jiggle it, it it all of a sudden changed into its into its ice phase. Um, so when I want to show this to students here at Purdue, I have to um, uh, have somebody stock a, a freezer for me with water bottles. You know, they'll put a couple of water bottles in every hour. And then after about uh, uh, after several hours, like six hours or so, then, you know, I can take a class down there and show them this uh, super cooling phenomenon is what this is. So um, this is a phenomenon that can happen in in uh, any first order phase transition because in going from ice to liquid, there's a latent heat of transition. You can, if you change the temperature too quickly, you'll miss the phase transition and you won't, won't have worked out that latent heat of transition yet. So, so this is a great example of uh, that type of physics that can come up in a first order phase transition. You can super cool things, you can super heat things. The super cooling here, you can try yourself in the winter or just stock your, your freezer with, uh, with water bottles. We actually had in, in one class that I did this with, we actually had snow happen in the bottle. I, I'll have a student you know, pull these water bottles out and the super cooled ones look liquid at first and then you shake them and then they'll typically just turn to, to ice or maybe halfway turn to ice. Um, one of them snowed. And if you can imagine which way snow would fall when it's surrounded by liquid water, since ice floats, our snow traveled up in the bottle. It was, uh, anyway, I encourage you to, to try this demonstration if you, if you haven't already. But it, it brings out a property of phase transitions, of the type of phase transitions that we're used to in our everyday lives. The phase transitions that we tend to have experience with are water, either boiling or liquefying or, um, uh, freezing or melting, and those are first order phase transitions. First order phase transitions have a very sharp and distinct change in their properties when they happen. The super cooling and superheating is kind of a fun aspect of it. Um, but when you have a glass of water, you're never confused as to which parts the, the, the ice and which parts the, the liquid. It's very clear, they're very distinct. Um, there's, a, there's another type of phase transition um, which is a second order phase transition. And fluid mixing or unmixing is actually of this second type. So what you're gonna see in this test tube is two liquids mixed together. It's not terribly important what they are. Um, I think one is cyclohexane and the other is methanol, but you're seeing them mixed at high temperature and then at low temperature, they're not miscible anymore. So we're watching the temperature slowly lower and these two liquids are gonna unmix but watch the crazy stuff that happens at the phase transition point. We're starting to see these white tendrils that are fluctuating throughout the test tube. And eventually that white part takes over the whole sample. This moment right here is called critical opalescence. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. And then as we watch uh, longer, uh, as, as the temperature is lowered more, um, the heavier liquid is going to start to gather at the bottom and you'll start to see that this really was an unmixing transition. There's that heavy liquid gathering at the bottom. The lighter liquid is gathering at the top. The white region in the middle is still in the midst of the, of the phase transition and it's a second order phase transition. It's not this sharp, abrupt um, change of properties of a, of a first order phase transition um, because you know, they're two liquids and, and um, they're, they're mixing or unmixing. It didn't have, a, have a, a sharp change in properties, but it was more of a continuous change in properties. And when, when we have that type of phase transition, the, there's a phenomenon, uh, well, there's, there's critical phenomena that happen at that. So I'm gonna back it up a little bit, backing up the video to where we're getting, so now I've taken it back to the high temperature phase, it's mixed. We're gonna lower the temperature. It's starting now to, to enter that phase transition regime. And the evidence is these white patches. What's going on in there, the reason that it turned white is because 
inside those fluctuations, there are actually other fluctuations happening inside on a cascading set of link scales. So down and down and down and down. So if you were to zoom in and zoom in and zoom in, these structures would, would look the same. They'd look self-similar. And because there are fluctuations on all link scales, then the, the, those fluctuations scatter light of all wavelengths. And so it looks white to us, but it's, it's evidence of the density fluctuations that are happening inside uh, the test tube. So, um, so this is, anyway, this is a, a, a type of phenomenon that can happen at certain kinds of phase transitions. So what, what happens at a, what's called a continuous phase transition is that as you're going through it, you get these fluctuations on all link scales, meaning there's no characteristic length scale. Um, if you were to describe it mathematically, you would use what's called a power law. It, it means that you don't have um, you don't have a characteristic length scale to cut off any of the behavior. Um, the behavior, the same behavior, is happening at all length scales. Um, and I use the word fractal here. They're not um, that language isn't always used, but it, it it is appropriate here because if you if you look at the density of what's going on, the density fluctuations are happening on on all length scales. So if you zoom in and zoom in and zoom in, it'll look uh, the same. And that's odd. That's a very odd property, right? To have something where when you zoom in and you zoom in and you zoom in, it looks the same on all properties is not part of our everyday experience. So. Um, I like cats, so here's a cat. A cat is something that's not fractal. I'm just showing it to show you that. Um, that is, when you look at the cat on a large uh, length scale, it looks like a cat. You can see the ears and the tail. If you looked at it at too large of a length scale, it would look like a tiny point and would look, wouldn't look very cat-like anymore. But if you zoom in, you see the fur. Now, all three of those views of the cat are very distinct. So the cat is not scale invariant. There's a scale associated with a cat. It's about this long, right? So since there's a characteristic length scale, it's not a, a scale invariant object. So a scale invariant object has no characteristic length scale. Um, so here's an example of a Sierpinski carpet where you've taken a triangle and you inscribe a triangle inside and delete that material. And then of what's left, you repeat that process ad infinitum. You inscribe another triangle and delete that material, and then inscribe triangles and what's left and delete. And you just do that all the way out to infinity. You don't lose the material entirely. What you're left with is a fractal, something that's self-similar. So if you zoomed in on this, it would look the same, and it would look the same. Here's another example of a, a zoom in. This is an actual zoom in of a fractal not done by me. There's the, the YouTube link to this. But this is a Mandelbro set, which is a fractal. And so what you'll notice is that as we zoom in and we zoom in, it's like deja vu, OK? And yet this is zooming in and zooming in and zooming in, and yet you see the same structures repeated again and again and again. So that's um, uh, one of the properties of, um, of fractals, is that, that they have that, that scale-free kind of behavior. So we see this interesting, intricate pattern formation happening in certain quantum materials that the electrons take on these, these intricate shapes. And so, um, so we ask the question, basically, it, are these textures that you're seeing right here, are any of them scale-free? If they're scale-free, then they would be fractal. And the one place we know how to get fractal textures out of phases of matter and phase transitions is near a second order phase transition, the kind that's like what I showed you in the test tube, where you get those, ten those white tendrils, where inside the white tendrils, there's fluctuations on all link scales down to the atomic level, and therefore it scatters all wavelengths of light. If you look at the patterns happening in this metal insulator transition material here, the metal and insulator patches, um, the, the green parts, the metal, have holes inside of them. And some of those holes have holes inside of them. So there could be scale-free behavior there. Same thing here. In fact, we, we have um, applied those kind of um, analysis ideas to, to these images. Um, and um, uh, I'll give the reference for that for that at the, at the end. So in fact, we do believe these are, are fractal. They have power law behavior in them. Um, and what I want to focus on here in this talk is, is these guys, the, the cuprate superconductors. And we want to ask the question, are, are the stripe orientations here 
giving some sort of scale-free behavior. Clearly, there's some length scale in the stripe behavior. This distance from one line to the next is about 16 angstroms, which is four times the chemical unit cell, by the way. So this really is a spontaneous electronic structure. If you look just at the positions of atoms, there's no hint of this kind of structure. This one in the upper right is also about stripe orientations. I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about how this one was mapped. But the question we've asked is, do these have scale-free structures in them? If so, they're fractal. And you can use those the, the, um, the physics of fractals to help identify what drove the underlying phase transition. And so that's, uh, that's what we've been, been interested in since the fractals occur near second order phase transitions like they did with, this, um, with the unmixing in this test tube. We'd like to use those kind of ideas to help us identify what's going on with the strange and intricate and actually fractal pattern formation happening with some quantum materials. Now, here's something that we find extremely exciting about this way of looking at surface probe images in condensed matter physics. There are a lot of different surface probe images. Um, I showed you some scanning, tunneling microscopy. I showed you some photo emission spectroscopy. I showed you some scanning near field optical microscopy. It doesn't matter uh, if you don't know exactly what all those are, but they're different modalities. There's at least 20 different scanning probes to where we can get uh, highly detailed images of the surfaces of materials. And, and uh, one of the, standard critiques of those experimental probes, you know, much, much to the chagrin of my experimental colleagues who use scanning probes, uh, one of the standard critiques is how do you know whether you're actually measuring bulk physics? By bulk physics, I mean we're interested in materials, hunks of materials, and we're interested in the bulk properties that they have. So if you have a bulk material, a crystal, and you've just measured the surface, how do I know if the stuff you're showing me, so for example, this, um, this image at the top is scanning tunneling microscopy out of Jennifer Hoffman's group. What she's done here is she's color coded for you the stripe orientation. So red has stripes going diagonally to the right. Blue has stripes going diagonally to the left. But, but the standard critique of a surface probe like that is how do I know that's going on in the bulk? This is a superconductor and, and we're interested in what drives the superconductivity in that material. It's a bulk effect, the whole thing's doing it. So if, what, if what's being shown here just at the surface of the material, if that's just a surface effect, then it's not the, the driving physics for what's going on in the bulk of the material. So one of the things that we're extremely excited about with this, this way of looking at this pattern formation with, uh, you know, with a mindset of, of, of fractals is that actually you have experience already in your everyday life identifying fractals when viewed through a two-dimensional window. So when you've looked out your window, I, I bet you've looked out your window and you've seen a tree. <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure if spring has sprung for you yet. It's sprung here. And so in my in my home office, I have a lot of windows. And in the winter time, and really up until a week ago, I saw all these lovely fractals out my window, very much like this one, the tree. It's fractal because the branches split and split and split. And so there's a, a scale-free uh, aspect of the structure there. And so this is one type of fractal that you might see when you look out your window. The one in the lower right is a completely different type of fractal, okay? This is um, frost forming on the window, which I bet you've also seen frost form on a window pane. And even though in both instances, you only had a two-dimensional view of that, you could tell whether you were looking at an object that is just confined to the surface of the window. So this frost here, isn't a bulk effect. It's not happening way out there. It's happening right on your window. This would be a surface effect. The ice crystals have grown on the surface in a particular pattern. And they have become a fractal. But by, by looking at the fractal pattern, you can tell that that's a two-dimensional pattern. This really is uh, um, physics that's confined to a surface. But that tree, <laughs> no one looks out the window, sees a tree, and thinks, oh, that tree just you know, is a surface effect on my window. You know that it's a bulk effect. All right. And, you know, you, you do this intuitively because humans are very good with uh, pattern recognition of images. But if you were to also apply the mathematics of, of, of fractal geometry analysis to it, you could see by the fractal numbers that this tree must be a space filling object. And you could see that this frost is a two dimensional object. So, in fact, this perspective gives us one way that 
uh, the surface probe uh, experimental tools can, can diagnose within their own data sets, can diagnose whether the pattern they're seeing is something that's purely two-dimensional, a surface effect that grows just on the surface of the material, or whether it's a bulk effect that started deep inside the material, and then this, this fractal intersects the surface and you're just seeing that, that, that uh, snapshot of it. So this gives you the opportunity to, to do that. So our, our claim is that by studying the fractal numbers, you can diagnose, we can diagnose whether this pattern formation happening at the surface of Bisco is just happening at the surface or whether it's bulk deep inside. So let me, let me tell you a little bit about how we might uh, do that. So again, this is data out of Jennifer Hoffman's lab at Harvard. And the, uh, again, this is a 50 nanometer field of view using scanning, tunneling, microscopy. She's got a tiny tip, puts a voltage between the tip and sample and watches the current go through. And um, this particular one is a uh, single layer Bisco. It's actually lead co-doped. I didn't write that down. This is um, for you cuprate experts out there. It's an underdoped sample at 32 Kelvin, uh, meaning, I'm sorry, it has a transition temperature of 32 Kelvin. Um, and the, the field of view, I, I think I said 50 nanometers before, this one's 65 nanometers. Um, and, and so what's, you know, what's been done here is that um, she has taken local Fourier transforms of the, the images, okay? She saw a lot of textures and pattern formation and what looked like locally stripy structures. And those locally stripy structures, if you take a Fourier transform of them, will have a peak in K space corresponding to the wavelength. Okay, so, so here, for example, if you have um, stripes going up diagonally to the right, then that kind of pattern will give you peaks that whose whose wavelength goes perpendicular to that. So, so this region here, this blue region with stripes that are diagonally to the right, has a local Fourier transform with peaks that are uh, rotated 90 degrees from that. So this peak right here and this peak right here are due to that um, that underlying stripy texture in those blue domains. In the red domains, the stripe orientation is is rotated 90 degrees, and so are the little peaks associated with it. So this red region has stripes going diagonally to the left, and the peaks in the Fourier transform show you that wavelength. So, so what she's done is, is locally taken, taken a local Fourier transform and then colored each spot of the sample according to which direction the stripes are going. So again, in the blue regions, the stripes are diagonal to the right. In the red regions, they're diagonal to the left. And so, uh, what our group was interested in, in, in these fascinating data sets, is the, is the pattern formation. So now that she's mapped that out, do we think we're looking at something that's fractal or not? And so one, um, one key uh, telltale sign that you have a fractal is if you have structure on multiple length scales. So if we just look at how big are the clusters here, so how big is a blue region? How big is a red region? Okay, And we were to say count how many of each type? Well, there's basically one big cluster. This red cluster here actually goes all the way. You can, you can walk from site to site and stay only on red and traverse from one side of the sample to the other. So there's one system spanning cluster. There are several medium clusters. So here this blue one is, is a medium sized cluster. This blue one is a medium sized cluster. This blue one here is a medium sized cluster. And that there are many, many tiny clusters. So I've circled in orange here, some tiny little, oops, some tiny little red clusters here. So there does seem to be structure on all link scales. Um, if, you, if you even you know, look at the boundary here, that boundary between red and blue is not a straight line. A straight line is a one dimensional object. This is something that has a lot more structural structure to it, so it could itself be a fractal boundary. Um, and and there, you know, the question is, okay, then is there a power law distribution? I'll show you uh, that that there actually is a, a power law distribution in the cluster sizes in uh, in this image and and others coming uh, uh, other others near similar doping. So there does seem to be some sort of fractal texture there. I'll I'll show you that uh, analysis in a, in a minute. So we think. That means it's near some sort of critical point. If it is, then the exact power laws that are coming up, those, those numbers that control the power law, are like a fingerprint for diagnosing exactly what type of phase transition you have. We call them universality classes. So if we, if we can get these numbers out of the image, it'll tell us 
important things like the dimension in which it's happening. Is it happening just on the surface or is this a bulk effect? And it can tell us important things like what kinds of interactions are present, maybe interactions aren't important, or what kinds of disorder are present. So let me, let me give you a model to make this a little bit more con concrete, okay? So we're interested in, in this case, stripe orientations. And in, uh, in the images uh, from, from Jennifer Hoffman's lab, the stripes are either one direction or the other. So uh, theorists like an either or kind of variable because we can use an Ising variable to describe it. So here I've written down a Hamiltonian that where, for example, um, these blue patches are now vertical up, the red patches are, are horizontal. Um, I'll call a blue patch, this variable here, sigma equals plus one for a vertical patch and sigma equals minus one for a horizontal patch. And so we make the reasonable onsets that two neighboring stripe patches interact with each other and would prefer to be aligned. Okay, and so that's what this first term does. It says the energy will be lowered if two neighboring stripe patches have the same Ising variable. Up likes to be near up, uh, sideways likes, likes to be near sideways. Um, I've separated out um, interlayer uh, interactions from interactions that might happen between layers because this is a highly layered sample. Um, there's weak coupling from plane to plane. So I wanna allow for the fact that that coupling from from plane to plane might be weak. It might even be so weak that it's not important at all, right? Um, and here, the last term is how we're taking into account material disorder. <clears throat> so you might imagine in these materials, okay, you can kind of see there's something that looks a little disordered to the eye. In fact, to get the interesting superconducting behavior, you have to dope the material, meaning you've done some chemical substitution in it in order to get into the interesting superconducting regime. And chemical substitution is an uncontrolled process typically. And so these dopant atoms go in random positions. So they are a source of disorder. And so the idea is that you might think that, well, maybe locally in one spot, the local dopant atoms take a particular configuration that breaks rotational symmetry. It, it has to break rotational symmetry. And so it might drag the stripes in this direction. And maybe over here in this other part of space, the disorder pattern's different and it tends to drag the, the stripes uh, into the horizontal position. So the way we model that is through what's called a random field. Uh, it's, it, it's like putting a little random magnetic field on these uh, little spin variables, uh, vertical or horizontal. And so we call that random field uh, disorder. The model has been studied a lot. That's called the random field Ising model. And there are several types of phase transitions that could happen in the model. Several, but it's not infinite, okay? It's countable. And each of them is a second order phase transition. Um, and each of those second order phase transitions has characteristic fractal numbers that tell you which part of the phase diagram you're in. And so you could have the two dimensional limit. Maybe she's just measuring a surface effect. Maybe these textures only happen on the surface and they're not in the bulk. She could be measuring a three dimensional effect. And our claim is that the fractal patterns change based on those two options. Um, you could have what's called a cleanizing model. Maybe the material uh, disorder even though it's present, maybe it's not talking to the stripes at all, in which case you would use what's called a clean Ising model. There's also the possibility that maybe your coupling constant is zero or temperature is so large that the coupling didn't matter. And that actually sends you into what's called a different universality class, uncorrelated percolation. So what are the types of numbers we can get out of this image? Okay, what are the diagnostics um, that can come with this? Um, so we, we can, uh, we look at, at several. There are a couple of fractal dimensions that we can talk about. One is the volume fractal dimension. And I mean a generalized volume as in, you know, in, inside the cluster is that cluster, how Swiss cheesy is it? Are there holes in it and holes in it and holes in it? So the interior of a cluster, is it compact and smooth or does it have holes upon holes upon holes? That is what the volume fractal dimension is about. The hull fractal dimension is this idea of the, the boundary between them. Uh, it's you know, it's not straight. If it were perfectly straight, that's a one-dimensional object. So what is the dimension of this line here? That's, that's the whole fractal dimension. Another um, uh, uh, diagnostic we can get from these images is from the cluster size distribution. That's that idea that there's one large cluster, many medium-sized clusters, and many, many, many tiny clusters. And that turns out to be a power law for which we can extract another, another number, okay? The more numbers, the better, then we have better ways to compare 
theory versus experiment. And then there's something called the correlation functions, which I see that I don't have time to get into, so we won't even worry about those. We'll stick to the ones that are a little bit uh, easier to, to understand, which is the whole fractal dimension, the volume fractal dimension, and the cluster size distribution. And so what we're showing you here is an analysis of Jennifer Hoffman's data. Um, and so this vertical axis here is the size of a cluster. Uh, we used the radius of gyration just to have a, a definite thing to calculate, but it's basically the linear size of the, of the cluster. And then the horizontal axis here is the perimeter, all those sites along the boundary. And then it turns out that the perimeter scales like the linear size to this fractal dimension, I apologize, they're lying on top of each other, but that should be R to the DH. So this is what we mean by a power law. Um, it's R to some power. That power turns out to be a fractional number. It's not a whole number, so we call this thing a fractal. Here, this is radius of gyration versus the volume, how many sites are in the interior. And that gives us another power law. So another thing to notice is that not only is there some sense of scale free here, it's fitting a power law very well, but it's also power law over, you know, uh, this is a, a log log plot. So in going from here to here is a factor of 10 and a factor of 10. Okay, so there's about two and a half decades of scaling in these images. Essentially, it's, it's showing scaling behavior all the way out to the entire size of the field of view. So we don't know if it keeps going, you'd have to get larger fields of view. And when you say larger fields of view to the STM community, they don't take too kindly to that because these are very, it's labor intensive and very expensive to get these images. But so we don't know, okay? It scales throughout the field of view that's been um, observed. And so let me cut to the chase and compare to the fractal numbers that we know can come out of the model that I showed you. So, um, on uh, so the line is data okay so each of the lines here is a number that we got out of that stm image we got the volume fractal dimension that's the green line the width is the error bar we got the hull fractal dimension that's the blue line and again the width is the error bar um, we got the um uh this is the cluster size distribution exponent called the fisher exponent and this I didn't have time to go into, but it's another measure, it's out of a, a correlation function. And then we compare it to theory. So the, the circles are theoretical models. Um, so we could have a 2D means it's a two dimensional model. There was the interlayer coupling wasn't important. Um, 3D means it's a three dimensional model, but you see on these 3D models, I've put an S here. That means my student actually worked very hard to do simulations at a free surface. Um, it wasn't enough to know those numbers for you know the bulk because it's not a bulk measurement you really need to know if i have a free surface what is it so um so my student forrest simmons worked very hard at getting these theoretical numbers here for the the free surfaces um and to make a long story short i've crossed off the ones that aren't matching very well what's left is the three-dimensional models so so what i find uh, uh fascinating here is that it's a method by which we can address the question is this bulk physics or is it surface physics? And, and I would argue that these fractals that Jennifer Hoffman's seeing on the surface of BISCO are actually coming from the bulk. They're measuring, they're, they're matching the fractal numbers that you get out of bulk models, bulk models when viewed at, at a surface. And so I think, I think we really have seen this kind of idea come to, to fruition in this case. And in case you're interested, those, those three-dimensional models, there were, there were two of them left in our analysis. One of them was the random field Ising model um, viewed at a surface, so a bulk 3D random field Ising model viewed at a free surface. The other one was a clean Ising model viewed at a surface. Here's the actual data set on the left. Um, and so, you know, it, it, these two look visually distinct, even though they had the, the same characteristic numbers. Um, the numbers aren't telling us everything. Um, and so, you know, the visual inspection here says it's probably more likely to be the random field case. And there are certain, you know, systematics that come up in a random field Ising model physics that we think match match the the rest of the of what's known about the material very well. So I will um, I will uh, end with that then that the pattern formation we think here is driven by a random field Ising model. Um, uh, and uh, so in the phase diagram of the random field Ising model, temperature versus random field strength versus dimension, the front axis here in two dimensions, 
the back set of axes as the three-dimensional limit. So, um, so the numbers coming out of that data set were close to this critical point here. We're close to a three-dimensional random field uh, transition. So this pattern formation then we think is, is coming out of, of that kind of physics. And so we'd conclude then um, that it's, it's in a near critical pneumatic state. I say disordered because there's other probes that are macroscopic probes that don't see actual long range order. So it does seem to be pretty close to the critical point. You know, it could be ordered or disordered according to this tiny field of view, but the, there, there's other bulk data that shows it's, it's disordered. However, there are scale invariant pneumatic clusters there. And in fact, um, these scale invariant fractal clusters are pervading the, the bulk. So it really is a bulk effect going on here. So our claim would be that those fractals are extending throughout the bulk of this superconductor. And, uh, and I'll, I'll end there, and I'm more than happy to, to take questions. Thanks for uh, sticking around this long. Yeah, thanks, Erica.